Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Promoting Health and Racial Equity Through Sustainable Home Ownership webinar. Thank you all for joining us today. Before we begin with today's content, I will take us through a few quick housekeeping notes for the WebEx features that will be in use for today's webinar. To minimize any background noise, all attendees will be muted for the duration of the webinar. You are able to use the chat feature, which should be on your right-hand side at the bottom right of your screen, to let me know personally, Miriam Carlone, if you're having any technical problems during the webinar, as well as submit any questions or comments anytime during the presentation for view by our panelists. As well, another reminder that this webinar will be recorded and will be available for view after today. There are two recommended ways to connect audio. First, you can use your computer audio, and secondly, you are able to use the WebEx Call Me feature to receive any automated call from WebEx in order to utilize your audio that way. Lastly, we do have the live captioning feature that is available at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. To view and hide captions, you can click that closed caption button on the left-hand side. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Amy Gilman, and she is going to open up our content for today. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am Amy Gilman from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and I'm really pleased to welcome you all to today's webinar on promoting health and racial equity through sustainable home ownership. As the country's largest philanthropy dedicated solely to health, RWJF is committed to improving health and health equity for everyone in the United States. In partnership with others, we work to develop a culture of health rooted in equity that provides every individual with a fair and just opportunity to thrive, no matter who they are, where they live, or how much money they have. Health for us is more than an absence of disease. It's a state of physical, mental, and emotional well-being. It reflects what takes place in our communities, where we live and work. And that's why RWJF focuses on identifying illuminating and removing the barriers to health caused by structural racism and other forms of discrimination and addressing the drivers of the historical lack of investment in communities of color, poverty, and segregation from opportunity. And in this context, we see housing as a critical determinant of health and well-being on its own and as a catalyst for more transformational change that creates healthier, more equitable communities, and in particular, improves economic and social well-being for communities with low income and communities of color. Because we all know that the long-term effects of structural racism and discrimination in this country have created and maintained significant housing disparities. Notably, home ownership rates are about 70% higher among white families than black families. And the larger impact of stable home ownership goes beyond fostering individual and household well-being at a community level a higher level of home ownership can help stabilize neighborhoods and promote increased social and civic engagement. Promoting racially equitable housing ownership and inclusive models for community ownership, like community land trusts, can shift land and property from predatory owners and provide lasting community assets and opportunities for shared equity and wealth building for families and communities. We're still learning in the housing space, which is why we had asked APT to produce its analysis of a wide array of housing ownership opportunities that promote long-term racial equity and health outcomes that policy leaders, practitioners, and funders can all have a role in advancing. We're eager to learn more about the impact of different models, including approaches to community ownership and control of land and housing as a really promising pathway for advancing racial and health equity by mitigating against displacement and ensuring long-term affordability, increasing power and agency, and building wealth and economic opportunity, especially for communities with low income and communities of color. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff for what I know will be a very informative and compelling discussion. Great, uh, thank you, Amy. And um, really appreciate uh, your partnership in this project and also the um, support of the foundation um, and, your, and your interest in this topic, which is, um, very interesting and important topic. So um, hopefully if you could pull up all four of us um, so I can we can have a conversation here and we'll drop the PowerPoint. And uh, I'm gonna just do a little bit of, uh, of uh, setting of the stage here. I'll introduce myself and set the stage and then ask uh, 
the panelists to introduce themselves and then we're going to have a conversation so um so thanks to the panelists and thanks to everyone who is um joining in today so i'm jeff lubell i'm the, the director of housing and community initiatives at apt associates we're a mission-driven uh, research and consulting firm uh, focused on improving the lives of families here and around the, around the world. And I um, wanted to just start by emphasizing the importance of a balanced housing policy that uh, really provides support for both rental and ownership. Um, a well-functioning housing market includes um, really an adequate supply of, of homes for rent and homes for sale at prices uh, that people can afford. Uh, and then I wanna just note that I think the balance has been out of whack uh, to a considerable extent really over the last couple of decades uh, leading up to the foreclosure crisis in the 2000s. You know, there was a sense that, that it was uh, homeownership at all costs right it almost didn't matter what you know what vehicle we used as long as people got in homes and i think that led to um some really uh faulty financial products that really jeopardized families and led to equity stripping in ways that uh, um were really problematic and really undermined health equity and undermined racial equity uh and then we had the foreclosure crisis and then the, in the kind of the decade after that i feel like the pendulum swung really far the other way right and we uh now we're we're um deprioritizing home ownership and 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 you know the credit uh envelope tightened it became difficult to access credit and um uh you know because home ownership is and has always been the biggest driver of wealth creation in this country that tightening of that credit envelope really exacerbated the um, gap in wealth um, across race and ethnicity, and so um, you know it's been a it's been a problem in the other direction. Um, uh, so I you know hopefully uh, we can get it right. You know swing that pendulum into that middle uh, area, and that's partly what I want to talk about. Um, in our briefs, we focus not on home ownership uh, at any cost, but rather we focus on sustainable home ownership on on homes that people can afford in neighborhoods that provide them with the <clears throat> with what they need to thrive um the, the, the resources in quality homes that are supportive of their health and well-being uh in stable financial products right <clears throat> all of that is part of i think getting this balance right um is really trying to make sure that uh, it's not just home ownership but it's home ownership that has certain attributes and certain characteristics that really matters um, so, uh, you know, we've done this landscape analysis and some policy briefs, and I, I could bring up a PowerPoint and, and, and bore you to tears with all of the details, but I, I think it's much more interesting to really uh, reach out to you. I, we've assembled this great team of, of, of three of the leading uh, practitioners in this area, and I, um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to learning from you in this webinar and continuing conversations that we've all had individually. Um, but with this broader group and, and then uh, with, the, with the audience as well. So if we could start um, by just asking you each to uh, very briefly introduce yourself. Let's go in alphabetical order, Tony and then Octavia and then Sai. Awesome. Uh, hi everyone. Thanks, thanks to all those that are lending their ears to, to hear what a brother and a sister has to say about the relative worlds that we live in and how we impact right this world when it comes to affordable housing. Uh, my name is Tony Hernandez. Uh, I was born and raised here in Boston, Massachusetts, where I live. Um, I'm one of three sons from parents that came from Puerto Rico uh, with no more than a 10th grade high school education. Uh, they came to, to America to look for better opportunities um, for themselves and for us, for their children. Um, I have a, uh, I went to school here. Uh, I went to Northeastern University. I got my bachelor's and my master's in architecture with a concentration in urban planning. I worked for an architectural firm for over 13 years, traveled all over the U.S., managed big products, um, managed big projects uh, around residential design, um, reached the ceiling point at the firm, felt the tug in my heart that I needed to do a little more for community. 
That led me to taking on the executive director's position at Dudley Neighbors Incorporated, a subsidiary of Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. So I got a chance to run a 30 plus acre portfolio uh, community land trust here in Boston, Mass uh, for seven plus years that uh, include uh, amongst that 30 acres and includes affordable housing, rental, commercial spaces, playgrounds, greenhouses, uh, community gardens of sorts. So I had the privilege to manage a portfolio of such um, that was really led by a community process. Um, and this year I joined Grounded Solutions Network as the Director of Technical Assistance um, with an opportunity to take the things that I've learned over my trajectory uh, in my career to a national platform around shared equity housing and figuring out, right, how we have conversations and get into rooms with really smart people about how to make the, the, the rubber meet the road around these discussions of creating these levels of affordability to, to Jeff's point about unpacking and figuring out these equations in different parts of the country. And so uh, that's where I am currently and I'm looking forward to unpacking more and listening to the other panelists uh, engaging from their wisdom. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Hey, hey everybody. Um, thanks, Jeffrey, um, for having me and inviting me to this panel. Excited to kind of hear from, from the other panelists. Um, Tony, I, I think I told Jeff on the call, I was really excited about CLTs and kind of been aware of the work at Dudley Street. So looking forward to hearing more about that. But as for me, I am from Philadelphia, born and raised in Philadelphia. My background is in urban planning. I am currently a manager at Pew's Philadelphia Research and Policy Initiative, and I lead our housing research there. Um, the goal at PRPI, which is our shorthand, is really to understand Philadelphia, thinking about both on the resident side and really how the, the government um, functions to really think about how the city and its individuals can thrive. So that's my short. Welcome, Octavia. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Sai? Thanks very much, Jeff. And, and Octavia and Tony, so glad to be um, in part of this conversation with you. I've admired your work from a distance and is glad to share the stage with you today. Um, I'm Cy Richardson. I'm the Senior Vice President for Programs of the National Urban League. The National Urban League is the nation's oldest and largest community-based movement dedicated to empowering African Americans to enter and sustain themselves in the economic and social mainstream. Um, I too am um, trained as an urban planner. Um, and um, so the kind of lens through which we kind of see these things and evaluate their efficacy um, is a kind of a place-based one from my vantage point. I've been with the league for 20 years. Um, previously, I worked with uh, at various levels of government as a policy analyst, doing legislative work, community-based work. But again, I've run the league's programs for for two decades, and as um, in that time, I've seen a thing or two, as they'd say. And so, um, I'd like to share some of that experience and world of view. But you know, our kind of perennial north star is to understand and to narrow the racial wealth gap. That's our permanent interest. I'm not only committed to that; I'm compelled by it, and really glad to kind of join the conversation today. Thanks. Great. Well, welcome, Sai. Welcome, all, uh, all three of you. I, we're we're going to do now for the next, um, you know, roughly half hour is uh, just have a conversation. I've got some questions for you. I'll give you an opportunity to make some statements and pose questions if you like, and then we'll open things up uh, for those of us who've joined. Uh, and thanks again. I see the numbers continue to climb of participants. So thank you for your interest. Um, <clears throat> Maybe we'll go kind of in reverse order. We'll start with you, Sai. So um, I think we can all agree that the disparities in the home ownership rate between, on the one hand, uh, African American and Latino households, and on the other hand, between uh, you know white households, non non Latino households, uh, you know, it's very troubling. Uh, but I, I think it would help us to really unpack that a little bit more and really understand what is it about it that's so troubling? What is the problem? What is the What are the consequences mm -hmm. of this very uh, stark disparity for, for families in the real world? Yeah, yeah. That's a great framing, Jeff. I mean, absolutely. Um, as I say, you know, this is our North Star. Um, that is to say that the intergenerational wealth building prospects of households of color is is a is a critical and important vector in this nation's economic empowerment and civil rights history and trajectory. And to be honest, it's what, as I say, consumes my my time and my thinking. So, so here's the challenge, as, as you laid out. I mean, the black home ownership rate has 
plummeted to levels not seen since segregation and housing was legal. And I think that should be a stark kind of, um, you know, uh, referencing point for um, commentators and observers here. But even more disturbing is the fact that in the decade since the end of the Great Recession, the great unpleasantness as we, we refer to it, it's continued to fall while every other demographic group has seen significant recovery. Now, the reasons for the, the, the crisis, Jeff, are well, well documented as you just laid out. But I mean, I'd only add, you know, including kind of systemic racism, equity stripping, and a significant loss of affordable housing stock and mortgages, which I'm sure Octavia and Tony will speak to. But it's compounded, though, by multiple generations of explicit discrimination under federal law that had a direct impact in suppressing home ownership rates for people of color, as well as by the unique factors that first generation homeowners face, like the lack of down payment assistance or experience advice or lack of it from preceding generations of homeowners, which is not to be undervalued. But from our perspective, even more troubling uh, is um, the data. And our partner in this work, and I'll speak a bit later about the Black Home Ownership Collaborative, which is a moonshot of an effort, cross sectoral, um, does designed to really attack this issue. Um, our partner, the Urban Institute, projects that over the next 20 years, all net new household growth will be from families of color indeed, but that the home ownership rate, if left unaddressed, will continue to fall for every other, for every group, age group under the age of, of 85. And that's, that's something um, that in a scale sense is stark and, and shocking. But more strikingly, the same study from Urban projects that the black home ownership rate will fall even further by 2040, with a decline particularly pronounced for households aged 45 to 74. Now, as home ownership is an important source of building wealth, as you laid out, this is an economic disaster for black families and households and their balance sheets who will be unable to achieve home ownership. But it's also, Jeff, I mean, really, it's, it's a moral and economic problem for the country. Let's call it for what it is. The safety and soundness of the future mortgage market depends on there being consumers who can access safe and responsible loans. Acting now to increase home ownership among underserved communities is not only a cost-effective solution to strengthen the middle class and grow the economy, this is where the action's at. Really, I really appreciate the chance to share our views on this. I think the modern civil rights argument and fronts in it exist within this conversation. So again, appreciate the question, look forward to the conversation. Yeah, no, that's... Uh, some great points. I, I, you know, I, people talk a lot about uh, the need to think about who's going to buy homes when all of these older people retire and and die, you know, and pass on. Are there enough young people? And those young people are are going to be disproportionately people of color, as you say. So it's it's interesting the economic impacts. I I'm also really struck by the impacts really on families of the stability that pr that you can achieve. You know, when you buy a home, I'm not saying you can't achieve stability with rental housing, uh, but but you know, if you have a fixed rate mortgage, you your housing costs are essentially fixed, right? And as your income goes up, you become better and better able to afford those costs. You know, and you have a forced savings mechanism that contributes to your retirement security, um, and you can physically alter the environment to meet your your needs and. And uh, you know, if you need a window for your mental health, you can put one in, right? You know, so there's a, a lot of really important things I think about home ownership uh, that uh, you know beyond even in addition to wealth creation that I think are really important. You know, um, really important to to achieving an equitable uh, and stable you know future for for everyone. Um, so so I, you know, you've done a great job outlining the problem. Tell tell me a little bit about. You know what the National Urban League's doing. You mentioned the Black Home Ownership Collaborative. Maybe a yeah. little bit about kind of how are they uh, tackling this problem? Yeah, and so just to just to circle back to get the points to your response to to my points. I and mean, I think, you know, while there remains a, a deep desire among Black renters to become homeowners, as you say, and again, our housing counseling network is driving that messaging. What's within your capability? What's within your within your um you know your imagination? should be within your touch, your grasp. Um, but numerous barriers persist, as you say, some overt and some far more subtle. But to close the gap, Jeff and, and colleagues, I mean, black homeowners, home buyers, need support through improved and targeted financial and homeownership programming and preparation. 
the kind of commitment to this kind of asset building um, is significant. And that's something as a kind of minority led minority serving institution, we're committed to that kind of preparation. But you know, uh, the, the Black Homeownership Collaborative is really designed and built upon the strategic partnerships between lenders, housing counseling agencies, and other key stakeholders that are paramount to reaching and supporting underserved communities. And the collaborative of which I am national co-chair um, identifies a set of seven tangible actionable and scalable steps that we believe will make it possible to increase the black home ownership rate um, i'm sorry the, to increase black home ownership by three million net new homeowners by 2030. that's an increase of more than 10 points in the black home ownership rate bringing it to a level never previously attained and from there new strategies will be developed to close the whole the racial home ownership gap completely but i would direct colleagues to to the website three by 30.org where we lay out the, the legislative, regulatory, and statutory ideas and other market-based ideas that can open the gates far and, and, and high to responsible home ownership. As you say, with that pendulum swing, I fear the swinging back in the other direction. We should be mindful of this, particularly with new policy actors on the, on the scene. Um, so, I, so it is a, a, a set of scalable ideas that have worked. These are not fanciful Pollyannish pie in the sky. These are investments that are um, driven from experience and understanding of their impact. And so I, I drive colleagues towards the website, freeby30.org, because you know gaps in the home ownership appreciation stemming from racism in, in value uh, market um, market valuations, for example, this also, you know, um, is a major issue that we've been dealing with in the in the real estate appraisal space, for example. So there are a number of of factors and um, and impacts on this issue. But really, if we are laser focused on those things that we know that work. And how do we responsibly prepare folks for them? I think that's the most balanced of equations and looking and that's what we'll be driving towards, Jeff. Interesting. Yeah, I think the uh, uh, what, what I, what's really interesting, I think, about the uh, the Black Home Ownership Collaborative is really how ambitious it is. Yeah, I mean, we're not saying let's do like a few minor things. We're talking about a 10 percentage point increase in the home ownership rate and, and also trying to bring in really a broad sector of allies you know, lenders and realtors and policy organizations, et cetera. It's really, it does take that comprehensive approach. And part of what we talk about in the in our landscape analysis is really helping localities also take a comprehensive approach. So don't just think there's going to be one magic bullet, right? It might be that you need to change your zoning and you need to, you know, think about down payment assistance and you need to address tangled title and you need to do a whole range of different things rather than just one thing. Uh, uh, um, because these are multifaceted problems, and they do, they rarely have a simplistic solution. I, I indeed, but but the rhetorical platform of the collaborative is three by thirty, and again, it's three million net new homeowners. We anticipate another wave of you know home retention loss mitigation work. We're in the front lines of that work, and so again, we're trying to kind of sustainably support home ownership. But for those who have made that leap. Um, we need to sustain them um, sure. and then build that intergenerational scaffold moving forward through their, you know, children and extended asymmetrical household formations, which we also know is an important factor here. But again, I think I think we're onto something here, and I do um, uh, implore my colleagues to be supportive of the notion and where they can contri contribute. Um, please do so. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Sai. Let's let's turn, uh, if we could, to Octavia. Um... And what what uh, led us uh, uh, to uh, to you has really been the the great work that Pew has done around tangled title, um, and we'd love to hear a little bit more. If you could just, uh, it's not always a term that everyone's familiar with, so maybe you could just start by telling us well what is tangled title and why why is it important. Sure. Um, so in Philadelphia, we use the term tangled title to describe situations where a property hasn't gone through the legal process required to transfer ownership, typically after the death of the property owner. It's um, a term we're welcome for everyone to use, but I think it was one that's coined in Philadelphia just because it's alliterative and really speaks to, to the situation. In our city, um, we focus on homes that are occupied by an heir, but these properties could be vacant homes or, or empty lots. Um, the thing to remember though, is that they always represent inaccessible wealth. Um, so I talked a little bit about the transfer of wealth, this wealth that can't be transferred or is not adequately transferred to their heirs. 
And when a deed's tangled, property owners are unable to access the benefits of home ownership. They can be ineligible for government programs such as disaster relief or home maintenance supports like the basic systems repair program in Philadelphia. And they can't tap into equity in their homes. So they can't get a loan to, to fix a roof. They can't get a loan to start a business. They can't get a loan to, you know, and, and when it, from their house, tapping into the equity of their house to do those things is not one of the options that's available. Our research indicates that the problem impacts more than 10,000 Philadelphia households, and I should say that's a conservative estimate, um, and it represents more than $1.1 billion in housing wealth. Um, for the simplest case, our conservative, again, conservative estimate is that it'll cost a little over $9,000 to clear the most simple tangled titles, making this a $96 million problem for our city. Um, and just one thing I really wanted to emphasize is like in Philadelphia, we have we we were one of those cities where home ownership was attainable for, for many black households, for many households that had lower incomes because of low costs and and other factors that are, are myriad. Um, but these homes that are experiencing tangled titles are often um, one of the, the most affordable or sources of affordable housing where you don't have that mortgage anymore, where really you're just carrying the cost of your property taxes or, or things like that. And so preserving that that home for those who are living in them and for heirs is a really important initiative and a way to think about keeping people in their homes. Yeah, you know, I uh, I love the, t the phrase tangled title. We, we we did borrow it and use it in our paper. I hope that's okay. We'll be spreading it, <laughs> spreading it out from Philadelphia on. Uh, I mean, there are, there's a lot about, about the really the inequities around home ownership that make my blood boil, but but as somebody who's focused, you know, on public policy for so long, the fact that we have a legal system that is depriving people of access to wealth they already have, I mean, that just makes my blood boil, right? I mean, this ought to be a solvable problem. Um, it's so frustrating. And it's it's not just in Philadelphia. I mean, it's, you know, heirs, title, you know, in a lot of places, in the South in particular, we hear a lot about it. And it mm -hmm. really disproportionately affects people of color. Um, and and it's, it seems like a problem we ought to tackle and solve. And what I was therefore very excited to hear that the city of Philadelphia is actually doing some things about it. Can you tell us a little bit about what their what their program is and their plans are? There are a few things that are going on in Philadelphia. Um, one of the most visible is that the city provides legal support for households um, facing tangled titles, and they do that through the Tangled Title Fund. Um, and the city recently allocated an additional seven million dollars to fund that to, to the fund that supports that work. So it's really um, legal services agencies and pro bono lawyers that are really working together to help households um, tackle the problem. So huge, huge infusion of cash. Seven million dollars is a big deal. But I just mentioned it's a $96 million for, for, for problem for Philadelphia conservatively. Um, another thing that Philadelphia is doing is the Register of Wills Office. Um, they started a probate deferment initiative, and that can eliminate probate fees for some households that are seeking to clear titles. Um, they've also been working to increase public knowledge on the value of preparing a will, and they recently passed a bill that was kind of, you know, an interesting innovation that requires funeral directors to share a fact sheet about tangled titles with families following the death of a loved one. So some of the big things that the city's doing. Yeah, that's great. I, I really uh, um, will be very inter interested to see and follow that and, and what, you know, hopefully, I know you have a real focus on research that you could kind of document what was the impact of that money and what was the impact of that education and really making a difference? It, to me, it seems like a relatively small investment to really unlock wealth for households disproportionately, again, people of color, you know, who can then spend that money right in the economy and they can use it to help their kids go to college and they can start businesses. And it's it really has a dynamic effect. And that's part of the focus in our paper is really on this idea that it that home ownership is not just about helping individual households it also helps communities right and i'm not again we need rental housing we need ownership we need stuff in between but you know when it comes to um you know unlocking wealth that can really help strengthen neighborhoods and i i i, I know philadelphia had i don't know if you're familiar with this there was a hud program called home ownership zones um where they they uh, made grants uh to uh, basically support concentrated investments in home ownership, and one of those cities was Philadelphia. So maybe we we can talk uh, later about about following up on that because I, HUD never I, the foreclosure crisis happened, so HUD never completed the evaluation of this program, but it was all queued up. 
you know, these these home ownership zones. So what what difference did it make, right? To to sort of support a concentrated investment in home ownership? That would be, I think, a really really important, interesting question. Yeah, great. That sounds like a really good area to follow up on. All right. Well, great. Let's go on to Tony. Um, you know, uh, Tony, you mentioned the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. That's been on my radar screen for a while. It's really one of the leading uh, sort of grassroots, uh, community-based, uh, you know, ownership of land kind of initiatives. And and it's really um, maybe maybe we could just go a little bit into this idea of like why is it important for the community to have ownership of the land? Like, what difference does that make for for the community and for racial equity more broadly? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, when when the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative decided to fight for control over the land here in, in the Boston area, um, it was because folks were being pushed out, um, right? As development happened, uh, what really blazed this trail in Boston was when a master plan came out for all this development to happen in this neighborhood um, and not one resident had an opportunity to voice what would happen with their property, what would happen with their families, where would they go, because they couldn't afford to stay in the neighborhood. And so that really ignited this, this, this blaze, this trail that uh, Dudley has been on for close to 40 years now. Um, and so it was hard. And so here in this part of Boston, uh, there's a predominant population of Blacks, Latinx, and Cape Verdeans in this uh, neighborhood that I live in. And so folks were being pushed out. And as folks migrated from other countries, as, as we all know this, it isn't exclusive to Boston. When we get fam that comes from different parts of the world, they migrate to neighborhoods where families at. And so they, they'll look to rent or live in neighborhoods where they can be close to family. So it isn't any different here. Um, but this, this uh, problem of being pushed out because you couldn't afford to pay a rent, you couldn't afford to buy a property because of development costs, is what led to Dudley, you know, blazing this trail to fight to give community a voice and an opportunity to have control over the revitalization of a neighborhood. And so, um, for folks, uh, for folks that haven't seen the documentary, there's one on YouTube called uh, "Gaining Ground." It's about 11 minutes long, the short version, and it really sets the stage for what um you know uh created the movement here in boston and so it's a natural thing for families to gravitate to places where they have family uh and one of the mission values that dudley took on when they fought for control over land uh in the mission statement is to create development without displacement was is a big mission value that dudley uh, to this day continues to carry and so in my practice, when I ran the land trust, I would always go back and check myself and say, in, in, in the initiatives that I'm pushing forward, am I addressing the development without displacement mission value to this work? And if, and if I answered that question wrong, then I was off. I was off the rail. And so development without displacement became a key mission value for the work that Dudley did here. Um, and, to give, and to give folks a voice right, to, to participate and to, and to let us know as a community organization, what do you want to see in your neighborhood? Um, and so the community has been and continues to be uh, the baseline, right, of the work that we've done for almost 40 years now. Everything that is interlaced in the work that we do, although we're blessed to be on this call and to be at, at the levels where we can speak with the attorneys, with the banks, with the local government officials, if you ain't bringing it back to ground zero, then you're missing the point. And that's the the passion with which Dudley has blazed this trail over, over the years and with which it continues to do so and what has led to the successes um, of the portfolio that I got an, uh, uh, an opportunity to manage and the right. work that it does at a community level. Great. Yeah, it's really a great, a great uh, initiative and a great success story. And one of the sort of tools that you all use, um, you know, there, you know, this idea of a community land trust, right? And and shared and and having home ownership uh, that is shared, where the equity is shared, right? And in terms of the family and the neighborhood, is now a, a big focus of your work uh, going forward for Grounded Solutions. 
which is, you know, I think the leading organization in this country focused on shared equity home ownership. Can you just tell us a little bit more about how what shared equity home ownership is and how, just uh, briefly how it advances racial equity? Absolutely. Um, so it's one of the things that uh, brought me from, you know, the platform that I got an opportunity to leverage here in Boston and over this neighborhood in Boston. It excited me to get the opportunity to join the Grounded Solutions team to further amplify this shared equity housing model of one of which is a community land trust model. But the shared equity housing uh, models uh, platform across the country that I get to leverage through Grounded Solutions Network uh, is one that um, I have a passion for. And two, another piece that really gravitated me to Grounded Solutions Network is that in that sharing of the shared equity housing models, there is not an on and off lens, but a permanent lens of, uh, lens of racial equity and inclusion interlaced into that work as we try to unpack what shared equity housing looks like in multiple communities and neighborhoods throughout the United States. And so as director there at Grounded Solutions, what I look to do is to, is to deploy parts of my team to different parts of the country to help unpack what a shared equity housing model might look like. You know, every part of the country is a different equation. All the variables change. Who are the players? Who are the politicians? Where's the money coming from? And so we look to unpack that equation and figure out what the best opportunity towards helping the rubber meet the road in building that affordable housing in that, um, you know, part of the country, as well as focused on, right, uh, filling this gap of racial equity and inclusion. You know, how do we get to the black and brown communities of the world to figure out how to level the playing field where these disparities exist most? Um, and so at Grounded Solutions, that's the focus is to create lasting affordability for generations to come as part of our mission statement, right? And with an intentional lens on black and brown communities and figuring out how to unpack each of those equations depending on where we're at because they, they change as you visit different parts of the country. That's great. It's great and important work. I remember I, I uh, there was a period of my time I lived in Houston and I was a, uh, did some work advising the city council. And I remember that, that one of the council members asked me, why isn't there anything in between renting and owning? Right. I mean, the, what she was looking for was something that was more affordable than your typical home ownership. Right. Um, but 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 nevertheless gave you the kind of connection that you have through ownership um, uh, in terms of having the ability to stay as long as you want, in terms of the ability to build wealth, in terms of uh, all of that. And and really shared equity home ownership is a tenure choice that falls in some ways between renting and owning, right? It, you know, it, 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 you know, people buy homes at a discount relative to the market um, and they, you know, have a, a regular 30 year mortgage. They they have the, the forced savings of a 30 year mortgage um, and they have a, a share of the home price appreciation, but but what they give up is the opportunity to win the jackpot and, and, to, and to, to like win the lottery, right? With, if home prices go up, uh, but, but, but uh, by giving that up, they ensure that the price is affordable to the next buyer, right? And so the home stays affordable to one home buyer after another. And I, I think it's a really interesting model. Um, and what my work on anti-displacement policy is really, uh, brought home for me is not only is it something that can help the individual homeowner, it's something that can help ensure that communities stay inclusive as they change, right? As rents and home prices go up, how do you get, you know, how do you get site control, right, over land and ensure that it stays affordable? Well, you know, affordable rental housing is one way you could, you can, you know, you know, build a light tech development, but another way is through shared equity home ownership, right? And once you, you know, put a ground lease or once you put you know deed restrictions on it that stays affordable over time so it's it's really a, a i think important again for this idea of of coming back to dudley street this idea of having some control over your neighborhood of ensuring inclusivity over time you know as neighborhoods as neighborhoods change um so i want to just do maybe just a, a lightning round uh to hear from you before we go to to the audience uh just anything you want to add start with octavia I didn't expect to go first. I think. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I think my final point is like often people don't know that they have a tangled title. They find out 
at an inconvenient time. There's a disaster, they're seeking relief, they don't qualify, they need a major repair. And so we encourage folks to do two things. One, check your deed. See if your name is listed as the owner. Um, and two, write a will. Those are things that are easy to put off, but the cost is great and prevention is far simpler than a cure. Um, one last thing, um, don't take for granted that your home holds true value. Um, the $1.1 billion figure that we cited for Philadelphia represent homes in Black and Latino neighborhoods, that Black and the Latino parts of the city, places that do have um, low housing costs in the city. And so really, I think it's easy to feel like, ah, the house isn't worth much, but it really does represent value that can accrue to your family and your heirs. Great, great. Yeah, I I, I mean, the fact that, 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 that when people die, right, is when you find, you know, what, the most important time, right, is to go through probate and the last thing you're thinking about, right, is the economics and going through probate. You know, you're like, oh my God, I have this home. What am I going to do? I got to clean it out. I've got, but, but it's a great reminder. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Sai, thoughts? Sure. Just just a few quick points. I was um, really taking notes and, and nodding my head to, to Tony's talk. I mean, I really think I'm buying what he's selling there. I and mean, I think, you know, the kind of the shared racial fate and that ethos of trust required for a model to, to, to be able to be scaled um, is, is a takeaway from we, we screen um, gaining ground uh, frequently um, in, in some of our affiliate um, communities where that inherent trust that other communities may carry and may proliferate sometimes is just, you know, just a bit short in, in, in native born black communities. We have to talk about the trust and re reciprocity and the social capital that rages in our community that can be kind of bent towards this kind of trust ethos that, that Tony is model bear. And again, I think that's really um, well said and well formed. My other, <coughs> excuse me, takeaways just would be in terms of what I spoke about, again, we're looking for um, accelerators, amplifiers, as we talked about earlier. I really think now is the moment in this kind of post George Floyd awakening that we're looking for, how do we support, again, minority led, minority serving institutions to build the institutional knowledge, sophistication, confidence, partnerships in place so that we can really build economic empowerment capacity over time, not just the snapshot in time, and that's easy to measure, but the motion picture, how it evolves over generations. That's the moment we're in now. And I also would like to uh, a shout out for, you know, an emerging CDFI industry, again, as an amplifier, as an accelerator to get capital quickly to communities before those with deeper pockets with, um, you know, um, you know, uh, beat, us, beat us to the punch. And, I, and that's what I am, keeps me up at night, is the ability to not be able to compete in this new normal where brick and mortar community development is where the action's at. And again, um, we're glad to be at the table in a thinking way, but we need to apply this thinking. And again, coming back to what's happening in Boston, there's a pathway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, uh, I, you know, when you talk about, you know, very passionately about your work um, and, and uh, you know, your focus is on empowerment, right? Uh, uh, for black people around the country and, and this idea, right, that not only can we help people become homeowners, but we also can have institutions that are, you know, where people of color are leading the institutions, the CDFIs, they're leading the development companies, right? So thinking about also like developers, like how do we help people of color who are developers, you know, really um, sort of, you know, they're at a, a disadvantage coming in, they don't have the capital, they don't have the equity, you know, uh, how, do, how can we help them launch? How can we help CDFI's launch. I mean, there's a whole, you know, a sort of ecosystem here, yep. uh, I think, that really needs support. And that's something that I think we need to think a lot about. It's a very nuanced way, I think the work that Capital Impact Partners and Ellis Carr are doing in terms of investing in, my, you know, minority developers, developers of color, and building a kind of um, community of practice around those shared boosts and blocks, I think that is, um, again, fuel for progress. Yeah, great. All right, Tony, uh, uh, thoughts? Yeah, my my follow up is is a, a slightly more personal one. Um, little did I know that in God's divine plan over my life, that I'd be able to share with folks like you on a webinar today to let you know that I am a community land trust homeowner. In two thousand and one, um, while I was working on my master's degree and living off of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for a year, as I as I as I lived like a typical grad student. Um, I was able to get my name into a lottery for a new home here in Dudley. 
Um, and I got the chance to buy the home that I currently live in. So, which has been for more than 20 years. And uh, I, I, I take off my, my, my professional fancy cap and I put on a homeowner's cap because usually there's skepticism about the opportunity of affordability in this, in this world, right? Uh, I noticed uh, Sharon's question in the chat box and I hope we get to that in a little bit, but uh, I am a community land trust homeowner um, home ownership has afforded me the opportunity to to lay a better path um, for my family uh, here in Boston. Uh, you know, my daughter is on the precipice of going to college, and so it has afforded me the opportunity to build up for that. To be able to take care of my family in this lifetime will be my greatest achievement. No matter what I do, I tell my daughter, I don't care if I'm if I'm hanging out with the president of the United States. You will always be my greatest achievement. And for me, it's family. Um, and I dare say that the wealth and equity that homeownership has brought my life um, through a shared equity housing model like this community land trust uh, has afforded me, right, potentially uh, the opportunity uh, to have done this a lot sooner than if I had waited to run the market rate route right, to, to, to earn enough money, to be able to get a mortgage from a bank, to afford a home at a market rate. And so this, this kind of gave me that shortcut. And over time, again, it built wealth and equity. It was able to enhance my career trajectory and to learn things that I'm blessed to be able to share with folks like you now. Um, and as you folks can, if you haven't noticed, I share with, with, with uh, some passion. I wear my heart on my sleeve about this work because I not only practice it, but I live it. And so there's usually skepticism in spaces like this. And I, I'll intentionally leave that for last and say, no, I'm living it. And I'm able to take care of my family and take care of mine uh, because of this opportunity. And so this is why I passionately do this work as well, because I want to clone this model some way, somehow, right? In 2001, I bought the Kool-Aid. Little did I know I was going to continue to drink the Kool-Aid, now I'm making the Kool-Aid. And so I do that passionately because I know I can't be the only brother and there's sisters out there that need this, that are less fortunate. And this does bridge the gap. So there is plenty of debate to be had about erasing the skepticism that the shared equity housing models doesn't afford people. It does afford, but you got to look past certain variables and realize what other things are afforded. Um, and I could definitely speak to that. And I'm blessed by it. Yeah, yeah, I know that. It's always uh, in, um, helpful to hear from a homeowner, right? And not just somebody that, you know, is running a program. Uh, let's get to Sharon's question. Um, you know, she asked, you know, I think very elegantly, you know, trying, like, how do you balance the goal of long-term affordability, right? With the goal of individual mobility uh, of a family, right? You know, another way this comes up sometimes is, you know, if the goal is racial equity, why are we saying to people who may be African American or Latino, well, you have to buy a shared equity home. You're not going to build as much wealth than a white person who's going to buy, you know, a fee simple home, uh, and they, you know, if the market goes through the roof, you know, they make a killing. So, I, I mean, I think there were some responses already embedded in here, but if you could just articulate briefly, you know, some uh, Tony, a few quick thoughts on that, that'd be great on the bridging the gap between the the affordability piece well just why why is it fair like you know for that people who buy shared equity homes particularly people of color have limits on the amount of equity that they can build and and people uh often people who are not people of color don't have those limits yeah i you know it's it's a great question and right now the lowest hanging fruit right on this tree is the opportunity to get into home ownership. Um, and again, I speak from a personal experience. I've over the years, folks are like, well, you ain't, you're not gonna make bank on your property if you sell it. I walked into the community land trust model knowing that when I bought my home, I knew I wasn't gonna make bank, but I was, I learned to educate myself of the opportunity to understand that while I wasn't gonna make bank on the property itself, you build, you build assets over time, you're able to, to further your education. You're able to build on your portfolio, your personal portfolio that does afford other things and builds uh, better credit, builds better opportunity of education, 
feels better, you know, raising of your family. There, there are a lot of variables in there that I discovered over the years that, you know, may have taken a little longer had I gone a different route. Um, and so because of that, uh, not to say that, right, folks have argued the ground leases that we sign under these shared equity housing models limits the appraisal value on these properties. And there's discussion now, right? The, the key terminology today is about wealth gap. How do, we, how do we close the wealth gap that exists in our world today? And while it is a very good conversation to have, my argument has been, I will not sacrifice the long game for the short game. And so how do we find the best middle ground to that? Because I agree, we wanna close that wealth gap, but I'm not sacrificing the long game because it has afforded me opportunities. And that's my prayer, right? Is that it reaches all of those um, to build not only wealth for the individual, but generational continuation of wealth and equity as I look to pass my house on to my daughter and leave it to my family so that she can have a leg to stand on. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, it is a challenging question. I, we actually uh, uh, work with the Annie Casey Foundation uh, uh, maybe two decades ago or a decade ago. To, we had a, a whole convening on this uh, this issue and and really, uh, you know, one of the things that stood out was just how many more people can be helped through a shared equity model for the same amount of subsidy, right? You can help three times as many or five times as many people um, uh, because you're not, when you make an investment, you're not just helping one lucky individual homeowner, but you're actually creating a, a lasting community asset um, that is helping one, one homeowner after another. Uh, and then the second thing is just the importance of of building wealth through paying down principal balance on your mortgage. You know, it's like building wealth the old fashioned way. Um, I think we, we have this modern notion that homes are gonna just like triple, right? But really the way people historically built wealth was by the fixed savings of a fi fixed rate mortgage. And, and that's something that you achieve with, with shared equity home ownership. Um, so I, I wanna give Octavia and then Cy quick opportunities to, to jump in on this. And then maybe we can get to one more question. Um, yeah, I was just um, thinking about your your comment about the generational wealth aspect of it. There's the within your family aspect of generational wealth, but with the land trust model, like you can still extend that affordability beyond generations by preserving like the the, the ceiling through which um, these properties appreciate. It means that someone in the next generation could potentially own a home in a place that may have appreciated way beyond what is accessible to to, to our nation's black and brown households. Um, definitely want to make room on what um, make progress on what we can afford, but really thinking about that idea of opportunity of of place and opportunity of access. Um, the CLT model deals with that in a different way than just. The, your your individual household opportunity to kind of take the wealth and, and go. It's continuing it. So I just want to chime in there. That's a great point. Uh, si? Yeah, that's interesting. And just, you know, just to be provocative and to reimagine the question and almost as a coda to, to Tony's point, I mean, I think, you know, policymakers could really investigate different paths to, to material security and increasing black wealth. I mean, options could include, you know, more bus social welfare programs that replace the need for personal wealth accumulation, shifting from programs that center housing as a commodity to housing as a right to shelter. And then really, you know, this is, you know, akin to, or at least, you know, um, germane to a comprehensive conversation around what a reparations program might look like in terms of how do you identify and invest in those aspects of, of economic life, which we know have been accelerators for other communities. I think the equity question requires us to look there as well. Great, great, great point. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to, 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 we could probably have another hour conversation. This is a very rich area. I want to just uh, pull up one more question that was asked by a, 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 an individual, you know, so you know, what happens if somebody loses their home, they go into bankruptcy, uh, but they want to buy another home in the future? Are there programs out there that can help that household who suffered that, that you know, that financial crisis? I'll just say quickly, um, yes. And that's what the kind of pre and post purchase housing counseling ecosystem is about to kind of unearth and to, and to you know, uplift those folks. But again, in terms of terms of art, 
folks who are homeowners, but, you know, after, you know, a, a period of time, I think it's three years through an unpleasant experience can, you know, attempt to become a homeowner. Those re-entering, those re-entering homeowners, I think is an important marketplace uh, for us within not only the, the Black Home Ownership Collaborative's work, but I think nationally, those folks who are brave enough, prepared enough uh, to try again, I think that's um, um, a really low-hanging marketplace for those of us who are looking to serve them. Yeah. Thanks, I, Tony. Yeah, some of the practices that we use, right, that, that defends some of these shared equity housing models, like the community land trust that I run here in Boston, is they're designed to try to prevent some of these things from happening in the first place. When, you know, in the community land trust model and the homes that we manage in the portfolio here, right, the ground lease that folks sign comes with uh, a ground lease fee that kind of helps um, internally. It's more of an admin fee to cover some of the costs to pay folks that are employed right through the community land trust office um, and to cover certain bills. But it's it was designed so that when a family wasn't making these payments, these ground lease fees, right here in Boston, they're charging $49 a month, right, for a ground lease fee. If we found a family to miss a few payments, that for us raised a flag that would that would push us to inquire with the family and say, hey, we haven't heard from you. You haven't made your payments. You know, is everything okay? Come to find out they've lost their job. Come to find out, you know, things have happened that have really turned their landscape around. It gives us the opportunity to begin to have the conversations, to find banks, to find opportunities, to help them save their homes, right? To even not even not even get to the place where the, the banks are taking the homes away. And so the community land trust model and shared equity housing models are designed, right, with mechanisms that raise flags to stay ahead of the curve in order to preserve this affordability. We like to serve as the third leg on the stool per se, and that's part of the design. It's intentional so that, you know, we're not necessarily giving keys to folks to brand new homes and giving them a slap on the button saying, good luck. No, we're involved and we wanna help them be the best homeowners they can be. So there's an example of how we preserve, right? Under that, under that protective bubble. That's, I think, a great place to, uh, we're kind of running, coming up on the hour here to kind of to end our conversation. Um, uh, so I, I, I want to thank Tony Hernandez, Octavia Howell, and Cy Richardson for uh, participating and sharing their experiences and also for just the work that you're doing. Um, and uh, maybe if you could uh, just pull up the PowerPoint, we'll just take a quick look at um, uh, uh, two slides here to kind of close things out. Um, first slide is one that um, it just gives you a quick preview of some of these materials and tells you where you can find out about them. So um, if uh, the website, if, uh, if and when the PowerPoint uh, shows up, I know it takes a little while, is uh, appassociates.org slash homeownership equity. Um, and we have a landscape analysis and we have policy briefs on tangled title on shared equity homeownership um, and uh, on um, uh, the um, appraisal gap and small balance mortgages, which is something that we didn't really get much of a chance to talk about today. Um, and uh, also the uh, resident and nonprofit ownership of manufactured housing parks. Um, so uh, please check those out. I uh, would love to get feedback from you. And really what this is designed to do is be very practical about if you're a funder or if you're a a practitioner or you're a policymaker and you care about about uh, trying to to advance health and racial equity through home ownership in your community what can you do and very specific things and the final slide is just a preview of some of um what's coming up so on um, the 15th uh we will have another webinar on social determinants of health and child welfare and then in december on the 13th there's a webinar on social determinants of health and accountable care financing. A few places where you can follow APT here and just wanted to thank you for participating today. Thank our panelists uh, and look forward to continuing the conversation um, and learning more about all your great work. So thanks so much.